Um, so Colin, you've conducted extensive research about trans possession states um, and paranormal experiences in people with uh, dissociative identity disorder. And I think I understand correctly that, the, that those samples were people from uh, United States, Canada uh, and China. Can you tell us something about how these experiences were defined in the study um, and what percentage of uh, participants reported having such experiences? So uh, all of that's based on my dissociative disorders interview schedule, which is a standardized structured interview. And there's a format for the interviewer asks all the questions. There's also a format where you just answer them yourself. And most of their search is the interviewer administered form. So there's questions about uh, psychosomatic symptoms, depression, uh, psychotic symptoms, borderline personality, dissociative symptoms, and then DSM diagnostic criteria. And there's a section called ESP paranormal experiences, which I put in there, this is in the 80s, uh, because I already had noticed that people with then MPD we're describing a lot of paranormal experiences. So it's just very straightforward question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. Have you ever had experience with, and then it goes through uh, ghosts, poltergeists, mental telepathy, seeing the future while awake, seeing the future in dreams, moving objects with your mind. And then I included deja vu in there, which is not exactly paranormal. <laughs> so at contact with spirits uh, or ghosts, and then sort of other that where they could write in the answer. So it's the classic ESP paranormal experiences. The, and so, uh, so how how were those um, ESP paranormal type experiences um, understood to be different from? Um, experiences of some kind of psychosis? How was that differentiated? Uh, well, in the interview, you just ask the questions. Right, okay. And so the differentiation would be all, all the clinical conversation around that. Mm. And uh, generally speaking, it's tricky to tell the difference between psychosis and dissociation in some ways, because hearing voices talking out loud, telling you to kill yourself, yelling at you, talking to each other, is more common in DID than it is in schizophrenia. Mm. And the quality of the voices is not different, whether they're inside the head, outside the head, they're angry, they're all those characteristics don't differentiate. The thing that seems to differentiate psychotic from dissociative voices is people with DID more commonly have child voices and the voices start earlier in life. Mm. So sometimes it's very obvious. There's no reason to think this is a person psychotic, very mm. organized, thinking, very grounded, very sensible. And then sometimes when you're talking to somebody, it's just completely jumbled up thought processes, you know, wild delusions, and it's obvious. But in the middle, it's kind of a subtle differentiation, but that's just the label you put on the experience, which I think is less important than psychiatry makes out, because mm. I think for instance, hearing voices or having paranormal experiences doesn't really tell you therapy, medication, psychosis, dissociation. It needs a lot of exploration. You mentioned um, that people uh, will hear voices um, and, and, and you talked uh, about those sort of like voices being, you know, uh, punitive in, in some way. Um, but often people talk about having, you know, a voice who is comfort or a guide. Sometimes they'll talk about feeling that this, this voice is different in some way from other voices that um, they, they hear. And there is a sense that, you know, this isn't, this isn't me, but I'm being open and receptive to some kind of spirit guide or angel or ancestor whatever it might be that um you know how that how they define that was was that sort of experience um being coming through in that research or or was it there um you know weren't you looking into what the type of voices were 
the voices, the, those questions are actually in a different section of the interview. So right. People with DID, uh, about a third describe being possessed by a demon or some other entity or force. Um, deja vu, which I think isn't really paranormal, it's 50% of the general population report deja vu. So it's very common. Um, one of the papers I published was called Paranormal Experiences in the General Population, um, because I did the same structure interview in a general population sample. And to my surprise, I had a nice table where there's paranormal experiences in the general population, and then a, um, a national level survey of paranormal experiences uh, done by the Gallup organization. And the figures are very much the same for ghosts, poltergeists, but in the uh, Gallup poll, one of the questions is, or was, have you ever channeled another entity through yourself while in a trance state? 2% of the population of the United States said yes, which I didn't think was that much. So these are very common experiences and they don't necessarily mean psychosis or dissociative disorder, but obviously they go along with the ID. The DID people have a lot of these experiences. I remember uh, back in Canada, there was at that time they were referred to as Eskimos, now it's Inuit. So this was a way up the Northern Arctic uh, guy who was down as an inpatient in the psych hospital, sort of depressed and suicidal. And uh, I was trying to convince him that his dad's, who was a shaman, <clears throat> belief that he could move plants with his mind was not a symptom of mental illness. It's culturally normal around the globe whether you believe it's objectively accurate or not. And he was completely, no, nope, it's just crazy. So like I was trying to talk him back into his traditional culture in a sense, and he was no, oh, I'm a big city white guy. It's a very mm. unusual experience. Mm. So these experiences are worldwide uh, in all kinds of cultures, whether you believe they're accurate or not accurate or sometimes accurate but they're much more common in trauma survivors, complex PTSD, DID, than the general population. Um, well, and people who develop DID have experienced horrendous, um, you know, abusive and, and traumatic experiences. Um, did the trance paranormal possession experiences that people reported occur predominantly during childhood as they were going through those experiences, or did they also continue into um, to adulthood? Um, I'm not sure about predominantly, but they definitely continue in adulthood. And of course, the classical experiences are more depersonalization, out of your body, going into the wall, or just, I'm gone. Um, by and large, I'm not real, real sure, but by and large, I think in people with DID, those classical paranormal experiences more start cropping up in the teen years and adult years. Because there's not Do that I, many. Yeah. Can you think of a reason for that? Um, number one reason is I'm not sure, but I think my model for these, why are there so many paranormal experiences in DID? is these are culturally normal experiences all around the globe, thousands and thousands of years, but they're culturally suppressed and disavowed in our culture. And yeah. then trauma, as we know, splits the mind into pieces. And so I see that as fissures in your mind and those experiences can come up and aren't so effectively suppressed. Mm. That's my little psychological model of how that works. And so, Things just seem to loosen up in adulthood. Also, mm -hmm. people can kind of cognitively track it and go, oh, this is a paranormal experience. As a kid, they might just go, huh. You know, yeah. heard grandma to me mm -hmm. and not think it was unusual or not remark on it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an unsolved puzzle. Um, <clears throat> uh, in the study, um, were there any cultural, spiritual, or religious beliefs that appeared to relate to um, how common or 
the category, the type of experience, or um, if they were positive or negative experiences? Were, did you see any differences around that? Well, in the United States, of course, the mainstream, especially in the southern United States, is pretty fundamentalist Christian. Yeah. And so lot, I've met quite a few people who had exorcisms of the demons, which is just angry personality states. And I've never met somebody where it was successful and helpful. All I've seen is exactly what you'd expect. So the part goes away temporarily, it comes back twice as angry. And the person drops out of church. So they lose the positive aspects of the church, which is the, the cultural ritual, the support, the feeling of connection. And they get really, really angry at God because they're mm. already angry at their father, which they project onto God anyway. Mm. So uh, then the other sort of perception of it is this is supernatural and scary and I'm just weird. But then the other dimension of it is, oh, this is my higher spirituality. This is a spirit guide. This is good. I really rely on this entity. It's not part of me like my other parts. That's a pretty common perspective, too. Mm -hmm. It really encompasses the, the demonic, horrible, negative, hostile, and the positive spiritual. I did another study on altered states of consciousness in my trauma program inpatients who have, they all have either complex PTSD, other specified dissociative disorder or DID. And just statistically, it was beautiful. These uh, altered states of consciousness divided very clearly into trauma-related, negative, hostile, internal conflict, and not trauma-related, positive, spiritual, life-enhancing, which just illustrates that Altered states of consciousness, spiritual experiences can be either hostile or positive, as we've known for millennia. Mm. So it's, a, it's kind of like spirituality and DID is a microcosm of spirituality of the last 10,000 years. Mm. Mm. So, I mean, that, that really kind of speaks to the, uh, you know, another question I had around how did participants understand or make sense or meaning from either positive experiences or, or negative experiences. And, you know, I guess what we see a lot with clients with, um, you know, abuse history is this, uh, you know, the whole locus of control shift, this happened to me because, you know, I'm bad, I'm evil, there's something, you know, wrong. And if they're having a negative um paranormal experience if it's feeling like a possession from um you know a negative entity or a you know a demon then um it's going to be most likely interpreted as, as this is because it's badness inside of me um, what about the people who had experiences of um you know positive entities or spirit guides or angels however they describe them um, how did they make sense of having those kinds of experiences? And was that in conflict with other parts of themselves that may have that whole locus of control shift um, experience or making sense of things? Well, as you well know, there's the problem of attachment to the perpetrator too, which is the yeah. ambivalent attachment to the perpetrator, which then gets internalized. So you have ambivalent conflicted attachment to yourself you love yourself and hate yourself. And then you have entities possessing you or influencing you that you love and hate. So it's the same kind of split at all these different levels. And as in DID, you get very diametrically opposed attitudes. Uh, mm. I'm locus of control shift, horrible, negative, bad. I deserve it. That's why there's demons around. Good people don't have demons. Mm. And then I'm uh, almost a, like a little positive narcissism. You know, I have a spirit guide because I'm an enlightened being and this is positive and that's who I really, really am. Mm. So those two perspectives are just at war internally in the person. Mm. Mm. One of the things I do, so one of my papers is called Talking About God with Trauma Survivors. And the, the basic idea is 
rather than this is spiritual counseling, so I don't do it because I'm a secular therapist. My point of view is, well, wait a minute. Why have we excluded this huge part of human history and human life from therapeutic conversations? Uh, to me, it's, that's kind of a superstition. And so to try and get that idea a little bit mainstreamed, I go, well, these are cognitive errors about God, which are inconsistent with the doctrine of the church that the person belongs to, because they're projecting all their negative energy about their dad perpetrator onto God the Father. And then it turns into God hates me, I hate God, God's ignoring me, God failed to intervene. And that's proof that I'm bad, but it's also proof that God's evil too. And then so I can sometimes not do, you know, kind of, I don't put on a cloak and all of a sudden do incense. I just, well, is that consistent with your church? Doesn't God love all his children, you know, unconditionally? Yeah. So maybe this is not about God hating you. Maybe it's about you hating yourself and not, and believing that you're not worthy of God's unconditional love, which goes back to you weren't worthy of your dad's unconditional love. And they kind of mm -hmm. go, oh. So I think you can talk about the topic of God in pretty regular you know, mainstream CBT terms. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be this universe that we don't go into. It's kind of like so we were we and a colleague were in England 15 years ago, maybe doing a workshop. And she was uh, talking to the psychiatrist, very British. And uh, he informed her that in England, in psychotherapy, we don't talk about love or God. I'm like, what the heck? Okay, we're okay. going to talk. Football? <laughs> All right, well, we'll park that one there, I think. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Colin, we've, we've talked about trance states, possession and paranormal, um, and that these may be interpreted differently by clients and therapists depending on their own cultural, spiritual, religious beliefs um, and experiences. Um, some people, whether they have trauma history or not, seem to be more open and receptive to um, their spiritual self um, than others. They may have uh, heightened intuition or what might be described as psychic or um, extrasensory perception. And this is a huge question, which, um, you know, there's no definitive answer to. So I'm just really asking your opinion. How do you think the spiritual dimension of human experience can be harnessed as part of um, healing without it being an avoidance of, you know, flight into health? You know, as we know, there, there are going to be some clients who will very quickly want to sort of um, launch into forgiveness. I love my perpetrator. I forgive my perpetrator as a way of really staying, keeping at arm's length some of the other conflicting feelings and emotions um, that they might have. And how can therapists discern what is a genuine connection with um, with the spiritual or higher self and what might be a dissociated part or does that matter if it's a meaningful experience to the client and helps them in some way so one part of the answer is if it's a internal spirit guide or it's the presence of god or it's my higher self or it's a part who's very spiritual why do i care as long as it's you know, pointing in the direction of healing, it's soothing, it's good for grounding, it's good for self-forgiveness, because really, it's not about forgiving the perpetrator, it's about forgiving yourself for what was never your fault. And I don't think I have any wisdom other than just basic clinical, keep an eye on it, what is your gut telling you, how does it feel, does it seem genuine, and if it's just like too quick, too much to believe, too fast, like they got cured in 15 seconds, then you're thinking, obviously, uh, that's a flight into health. And we see flight into health in the religious environment in the southern United States all the time. If you just pray on it, you'll be better. 
But yeah. then that turns into, well, yeah, you've got all these problems because you don't have enough faith. So then it becomes all oh, blame, 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 blame. And if you just pray more and believe more, then it's all mm. your stupid fault. It's mm. not our fault for abusing you. Mm. Mm. So there's all kinds of twists and turns on it. But I think it's just not deciding like in the moment so much as tracking it over time and seeing where it leads. Mm. And of course, this is, um, you know, really just my um, my perception and, you know, an observation of different clients that I've worked with um, over time where they, uh, they appeared to have like um, a much stronger connection with like their spiritual self and open to um, spiritual experiences, guides, whatever, however they may have described them, that seem to me to be, um, you know, really sort of like healthy and supporting them and, and guiding them in a, in, in a direction that was helpful. But they could also have um, experiences which seem to me that were more to do with their own unresolved issues and fantasies and, and projections onto people um, and, and situations and trying to steer or manipulate a situation, um, you know, in a certain direction. So they could, you know, those two things can co coexist. Have you sort of like come across that kind of situation? Yeah, repeatedly. So uh, one of my clients who's case history in my book called Military Mind Control. So I already have consent to talk in public about this person. Um, complex military mind control story, somewhat partially corroborated, but not proven. And a father, uh, where I interviewed her sisters and her mother about the father, and there's all kinds of objective confirmation of quotes, regular incest and so on. Uh, and circumstantial evidence about higher level stuff, but complex PT, uh, MPD system, you know, levels and layers and so on. And she's got an angel character who, the, the process in the therapy is we get into something and we call it a hand in glove reenactment. I don't know where I came up with that term, <clears throat> but she'll be, there'll be something going on in the present day, some relationship or conflict. But the feelings are like way, 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 excuse me, ramped up beyond the level of the trauma in the present. So the present is the glove and the hand is the past trauma that's you know, getting filtered in there. And so then we go, oh, okay, this looks like a hand in glove. So then we go back to what was happening in the, the mind control program in the past. Which part was it that was involved in that? You know, what are the cognitive errors, et cetera? Um, where does that part stay inside? And then the uh, intensity of the feelings gets bigger and bigger and bigger for a few weeks. And then, which it, then that turns out to be she's actually developing empathy for that part by experiencing the intense feelings of what that part went through. And then that gets to a point where it's like, oh, and then all the empathy starts pouring out, all the identification with the part. And then once that's happened, the it's like, oh, yeah, the angel is coming down. So visually, it's like the most amazing spiritual, intense, poignant experience. It comes down, puts her wings around the wounded child, there, or it's light around the wounded child. And then they go up into the sky, and the child is gone. And those intense feelings are gone with the child. It's an amazing, you know, spiritual resolution mm. through a whole series of you know complex multiple personality child parts that were involved in different stages of the trauma. Either as mm. the one there getting the trauma, or the one who was there observing the trauma. Mm. So like a dissociated observer part, and then she becomes a dissociated observer of what's going on in her present day life. And then the angel comes down and takes that person away. And then that dissociated observer position goes away. And then she's back to the empathy 
connecting with herself, it's like totally the most awe-inspiring thing ever and extremely. Mm -hmm. So why am I going to go, yeah, that's just an internal fantasy. Yeah. I don't have that yeah. attitude at all. Mm -hmm. And really, uh, I mean, I guess, you know, the last um, comment and, and question that, 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 that I have is if we think about, say, the use of um, psychedelics, psilocybin, um, and how we know that acts on the brain and just sort of like opens up pathways that aren't generally um, accessible to people in, you know, normal states of, of consciousness, and that uh, when people are using psilocybin, they can be open to all kinds of transcendent experiences that are incredibly spiritual and meaningful. And if we think about the trauma survivor who has a very heightened, um, you know, like on guard of needing to scan the environment the whole time to look out um, for potential danger, and detect things that other people may not notice, um, you know, early on in, in a situation, as this is poten potentially danger, dangerous, that I'm wondering whether that kind of like um, heightened hypervigilance that trauma survivors need to develop as a way of surviving also opens them up to these other experiences. Well, yeah, because I think all these paranormal capacities are hypervigilant PTSD survival skills, mm. whether they're objectively real or not. Yeah. And then if you can figure out how to nurture and preserve your own spiritual core in the face of all that trauma, not, nothing wrong with that, right? Mm. With the help of entities that are real, internal, external, imagined, whatever. So I think from a, a position of the therapist, I always am considering therapeutic neutrality. I don't, I don't need to decide, is this really a demon? Is this really a spirit guide? Is this a part? Is it not a part? I just work with them. Yeah. Yeah. Work with what's in the room or not in the room. <laughs> so far, I haven't transferred any demons from a client into myself. So phew. there's a, a number of, uh, Stanley Krippner, who's a very dissociation aware anthropologist who's gone down to South America and uh, done all kinds of interesting studies. He was at a spiritual, I forget which school it was, but a spiritual healing school. And though they had the same treatment protocol for epilepsy, DID, demon procession, and schizophrenia, where they do some other stuff, but they would get the therapists and the clients to lie down on the floor with their head at the center of the circle and feet at the edge of the circle. And then they would transfer the energy from the client into the therapist and the therapist would then release it into the universe. And they would do that for epilepsy, DID, psychosis, and possession states. Kind of wow. amazing, which just illustrates, well, hey, if the technique works, what do I care what the model is behind it? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. A lot of, a lot of food uh, for thought. Well, I look forward to the questions. Okay, see you soon. Bye.